for the good of the order. Tonight, uh, I want to speak a little bit about Hallowtide. The uh, early Christians were often persecuted. Um, in fact, many were martyred, uh, starting with uh, St. Stephen just a year or two after the resurrection. From very early on, the church held uh, memorial masses in honor of these martyrs on the anniversaries of their deaths, the beginning of what we would recognize as St. Feast Days. Uh, soon, however, there were too many martyrs to observe an individual feast day for everyone. And in many cases, their names and individual stories were not known. So at some point, the church began to celebrate a common feast day for all the martyrs. We don't know exactly when that happened. We do have a surviving sermon from St. Ephraim the Syrian that he gave in 373, where he makes reference to the uh, common feast day. Uh, and it's interesting the way he talks about it, because his, his uh, description of it is kind of casual and in passing, which suggests that uh, it was already something pretty well established by his time. Uh, however, the common feast day was celebrated on different days and in different ways from diocese to diocese. In 837, Pope Gregory IV standardized the date as November 1st, and he made it a solemnity, a high holy day, which meant that it was obligatory for Catholics to keep a vigil the night before. In England, the vigil became known as All Hallows Even, or sometimes just Hallows Even. The modern word Halloween is a contraction of Hallows Even. A century later, All Souls Day was added. <clears throat> and for the last 1100 years, Halloween, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day have together been known as Hallowtide or the Fall Triduum. Just as we have a Triduum at Easter, three days when we particularly reflect on Christ's passion, his resurrection, and the fact that we have a savior, we also have a Triduum in the fall. Three days where we're meant to particularly reflect on the last things, death, judgment, heaven, hell, and purgatory. <clears throat> there are many old uh, Catholic traditions associated with Hallow Tide. Uh, in the British Isles, there were bonfires, skits, monologues, uh, storytelling events about the souls in hell or purgatory or about the saints in heaven. Uh, there were scripture readings and hymns, group prayer, and then at midnight, everyone would go to Midnight Mass for All, uh, all Saints Day. Um, during Hallowtide, <clears throat> children used to make uh, vegetable lanterns. I have an example here. Uh, they would carve a, a, a turnip or be in this case a beet and, and put in a little, uh, a little tallow or beeswax and a wick. And uh, these were called soul candles. Um, they're votive candles, just like, the, uh, just like the candles you would see in the racks inside church, except that they're portable. Um, I don't know, we talked to Matt before the meeting. I, I'm a little leery. I brought, uh, I brought a lighter, but I'm a little leery about the sprinklers that I immediately overhead. So I think I'm going to leave it unlit. Um, it, children would carry these from house to house. Uh, and then they would offer to say uh, prayers or sing hymns for any deceased members of the family that lived at the residence. And in exchange, they would get a couple of pennies or a glass of cider uh, or something called a soul cake, which was a kind of scone-like pastry that was only made uh, during Hallow Tide. Um, now, today, it's almost universally asserted that Halloween is a thinly Christianized version of the Celtic festival of Samhain, one of the four great feasts of the ancient Celtic world. Uh, even Catholic sources will uncritically repeat this claim. Uh, Julius Caesar, in his book uh, six of the Gallic Wars, makes a passing reference to the Celtic calendar. And, uh, and, and we think, uh, although he doesn't say Samhain, we think that uh, Samhain was, uh, based on what he wrote, the, the, the Celtic New Year. But that's the sum total of information we have about this uh, ancient Celtic feast from uh, the ancient world. Our uh, earliest information about Samhain dates to the, to the medieval period. Um, we do know that uh, in the 10th century, uh, the Irish would, would hunt wild pigs in the fall. And, uh, and they had a post-hunt feast uh, in which they ate the Samhain pig. Um, and we can deduce a few things about Samhain. We know it was a fall festival, so it would have been connected to fall activities like the harvest 
uh, bringing in the fishing boats, bringing the sheep and cattle in from the fields. Uh, as a major quarterly festival, it would have been a time for celebration. It would have been a time for matchmaking. But that's, that's all we know about this ancient Celtic festival. So where does the connection to Halloween come in? It's not until the 16th and 17th centuries, a thousand years after the pagan world gave way to Christianity in the British Isles, and 700 years uh, after Christians uh, had been keeping, started keeping a vigil the night before the Feast of All Hallows, only then do we find people claiming that Halloween is a, is a thinly Christianized version of Samhain. And the timing of these claims is important. These are the years of the Protestant Reformation and its aftermath. Uh, one of the claims of Protestantism is that Catholicism is a corrupted form of Christianity, that it is shot through with pagan elements. The Protestants rejected the idea of purgatory and the practice of praying for the dead. They saw uh, asking uh, for, uh, the saints to intercede uh, on behalf of, of uh, uh, people as heresy. Um, they, they saw Catholics as ignorant and superstitious. So through, through Protestant eyes, Catholic Halloween practices were were self-evidently corrupt and pagan. So they began looking back for the, for the true pagan origins of Halloween, and they connected it to this ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. And just for context, this is the same group that banned the celebration of Christmas in 1644, okay? So, you know, you gotta, you gotta consider your sources. Jack-o'-lanterns, jack-o'-lanterns are one of those uh, uh, elements of Halloween that are specifically cited uh, as evidence of a connection between Samhain and Halloween. The name Jack-o'-lantern um, is a reference to an old Irish folktale uh, about a man condemned to wander the earth till judgment day with his, with his little lantern. And, uh, and if you saw the light of his lantern, it was said to be uh, a bad omen. The, the problem is the folktale originates in the 16th century. Um, we don't have a record of carving faces on vegetables before the 16th century. Uh, it's in the 16th century that we find the first discussion of children going house to house dressed up as ghosts or demons and demanding tricks and committing acts of vandalism if they didn't receive one. So you may be noticing a pattern here. The 16th century, the time of the Reformation, the time of the anti-Catholic penal laws and the start of the Catholic persecution. I don't think we can completely reconstruct the origins of some of the traditions that we now associate with Halloween, but I think the case is stronger uh, for the idea that many of these traditions have their origins in Protestant persecution of Catholics in the wake of the Reformation and the Catholic response to that persecution than they do to some ancient pagan festival. Uh, so are there vestigial pagan elements in the way people in the British Isles kept the vigil before the Feast of All Saints? Maybe, um, but the, the case is just not that strong. Uh, it's simply become accepted history through endless retelling, um, mostly by Protestant anti-Catholic sources. In the 19th century, uh, uh, there was a large influx of Irish immigrants to the United States in the wake of the potato famine. Um, when Halloween arrived in America, it, it adapted to its new home. Um, the Irish immigrants began making jack lanterns out of pumpkins rather than out of turnips and beets. Uh, they began to use uh, commercially made candy instead of homemade baked goods, this kind of thing. Uh, the 19th century was a time when there was a lot of interest in spiritualism and the occult. And this, this stuff became so mainstream that Mary Todd Lincoln held seances in the White House. Um, it was a time when there was a tremendous interest in, in uh, horror in literature. This is uh, Washington Irving and uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Edgar Allan Poe, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula. The, uh, in the 1870s, the greeting card industry had a seasonal lull at this time of year. They needed a holiday. The only thing going on were these Irish Catholic kids going house to house. And they knew that Halloween had something to do with the dead. Uh, and they loved the idea of going, kids going house to house and getting candy. But they knew if they were going to turn it into some kind of commercial holiday, greeting card holiday, it would have to be de-Catholicized. And so they set out intentionally to create a secular horror-themed holiday. They, they never really did succeed in selling that many uh, greeting cards, but they did manage to wreck our vigil. Uh, Halloween has devolved into all the things that, you know, we, we, we necessarily find objectionable. 
Um, and so when I hear uh, people say that as Catholics, we shouldn't have anything to do with Halloween, I understand where they're coming from, but I disagree. Um, we wouldn't say that rabbits and eggs are ancient uh, pagan fertility symbols, therefore a Catholic should have nothing to do with Easter, right? I mean, Halloween is our thing. It's an important day in our, uh, on our liturgical calendar, and it's important that we catechize about the last things. There's nothing wrong with a bonfire or a skit or lighting boat of candles or singing hymns or telling stories, even scary stories, if they serve a theological purpose. Uh, so my, you know, I, my annual rant uh, is that we should, we should be fighting to reclaim the holiday and to put it back into its proper religious context. I'd love to see an area church offer a midnight mass on the morning of November 1st. I'd love to be able someday to organize a, a Halloween vigil where we do have a bonfire and storytelling and uh, make soul candles and offer cider and soul cakes and so on. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to take this time. This is something that a, a battle that I've been fighting for, for several years now about uh, trying to re-Catholicize Halloween. And uh, anyway, in, in, in DeBrant, uh, next month I'm, I'm going to speak about purgatory. I'm also looking for some feedback. I'm trying to pick things that are you know, relevant to where we are liturgically, uh, and I'm trying to find things that are, you know, hopefully of general interest, and I have no idea how I'm doing, and I'm wondering if there are topics that are of particular interest to any of you, so I do want to invite any of you, if there are things that you would, you know, topics that you might like to have me cover, uh, please do reach out to me. All right, thank you. Thank you.